so my name is Armand. I work at a company called Mia Wallet. Uh, our slogan at Mia Wallet is uh, we are experts in cloud-based payments. Though uh, this is the slogan is not up to date as we do uh, more projects currently which are not involving cloud-based payments. Uh, for example, uh, push provisioning to Apple Pay, uh, Google Play, Pay and various other digital wallets. Uh, but today we're going to talk about security for cloud-based payments and uh, what is involved to provide it there. So agenda for today. Um, I just want to mention that this, is, this will be quite technical uh, talk. So you will see code and bits and bytes and so if you're afraid you can uh, still run away. Uh, but the agenda for today is just introduction what are cloud-based <coughs> payments because uh, I'm sure not everyone has heard about this uh, term. Then we're going to look at security requirements, uh, storage encryption and practical uh, protection for your applications. Uh, we have done uh, at Mio Wallet already three or four different audits uh, every year, so we have gained some experience there, uh, which I will share. What uh, at least what I can share. So, uh, cloud-based payments uh, refer to payments which are made on Android devices. This is when you look at the banks in uh, Latvia or Baltic market, uh, this is what you see when you open your SEB bank uh, application, uh, Swedbank or Citadela. Uh, you can pay with your Android wallet uh, straight from the phone. And uh, uh, this is something different uh, than uh, what used to be previously available for payments. So traditional card emulation. Uh, many, many devices uh, five, six years ago uh, didn't have a secure element built in within the devices. Secure element is uh, a chip on the device which uh, stores some data which is hard to retrieve from this chip if you are an attacker. Uh, however, uh, this was not normal a few years ago. Uh, this is from Android documentation, which you can see uh, you have on your Android device secure element and when you tap a card on a terminal, all the uh, APDU commands are forwarded to secure element. Your normal CPU would not be available to uh, see any of this data. This is still applicable for iPhone devices and uh, when we're talking about wearable gadgets, uh, for example, Garmin or Fitbit. So this is what has been uh, traditionally available. And yep, to, to access this secure element, to put the card in there, uh, you need to have a, a secure cha channel between the uh, device manufacturer and uh, issuer. So it is very gruesome and complicated task to get to the secure element from the issuer's perspective. Uh, and third party applications installed on this device do not have permission uh, to access this secure element. This is still uh, stands as of today for iOS uh, payments. Uh, you cannot uh, provision a card to secure element. Uh, so uh, we're talking about five, six years ago uh, and uh, this was a big problem for Google and for uh, banks. They, they wanted to put the card on secure element on Android devices uh, but there was no easy way to achieve this. So uh, one company in America, in Texas, uh, simply tapped, uh, they created a branch on Android source code and they implemented themselves uh, host card emulation. Uh, they, they had it for their own project, for their own purposes, testing in Texas and uh, I'm not sure uh, if Google accidentally saw this branch of Android source code or there were talks between this company and Google, uh, but Google liked the idea that uh, you can, you don't need 
access the secure element and that you can uh, use all the Android devices on the market to make uh, NFC payments. Uh, so Google had a look and they said, okay, starting from Android 4.4, this is uh, six, seven years ago, if I'm correct, uh, you can now access, uh, uh, you, you can store uh, cards on uh, CPU and you can access them for payments. So this was the time when Google published uh, Android 4.4 and payment networks, MasterCard and Visa started to look at this uh, as a solution uh, and look how to implement it in real life. Uh, so this is how it looks uh, when Google included host card emulation uh, on Android KitKat. Uh, when you have a NFC reader at the shop, uh, device NFC controller can pass uh, APDU request to host CPU. And uh, this was controversial at the time uh, because this is not secure because host uh, CPU uh, can be hacked, easily accessible, uh, memory can be read. And uh, many people still nowadays, they don't think it's uh, uh, secure enough or it's uh, even uh, idea which should be considered. Uh, however, uh, MasterCard uh, were the first ones to jump in into this. And uh, this is a quote for, from MasterCard documentation uh, that uh, host card enabled solutions greatly simplify and speed the development process of NFC based mobile offerings. So this opened a space for issuers to easily integrate uh, uh, contactless payments on the devices which were on the market at the time. Uh, so uh, MasterCard started to uh, document, start to invent protocols, uh, how to securely provide these payments for mobile devices. Uh, we have the CPU available, but uh, we need to have some strict rules, how to uh, make the payments, how to store the cards, uh, and how not to allow attackers to steal card data easily. Um, uh, there idea, which also is copied by Visa and Amex and Discover and other networks um, that you have a, a mobile device uh, where everything is stored encrypted and uh, credentials uh, are stored on device, device which are only for limited use. So there are only limited amount of payments which you can make on the device uh, when it's offline uh, or a uh, limited amount of uh, total amount uh, of payments. So uh, there's a lot of terminology uh, and uh, the confusing part is that EMV uh, uh, standards differ for naming and MasterCard has their own naming and Visa and Amex, they all have their naming but we can uh, just understand the basic principles. So uh, issuers, uh, in most cases banks, uh, they have uh, their master keys uh, for card payments. So this also applies for uh, normal plastic cards. Uh, when uh, each issuer stores their master key, it, that should be stored very safely somewhere on HSM. Um, but when we have a plastic card, uh, using those master keys uh, and using PAN and PAN sequence numbers, uh, card master keys are derived. Uh, so you can see that Visa calls them unique derived keys. I think that's the naming from EMV as well. And MasterCard calls them card master keys. So I will use MasterCard terminology today uh, as I'm more used to it. Uh, and uh, they are a bigger player in Baltics as well. Uh, so these card master keys are uh, loaded on the plastic card. So if you would be able to open the chip here uh, and try to extract data, which is very complicated, but uh, you could find a card master key within your card. And this card master key is what makes payment happen. So if you can break this card, you can get the 
card master key and start making payments. Uh, however, it's very complicated because this is considered a secure element as well, uh, or a safe and secure element, and there are many laboratories which are trying to uh, break uh, secure elements. I, I've seen it uh, real life, they try various attempts, they try to shoot even gamma rays, uh, uh, like radioactive uh, energy uh, to try extract even small bit flips. Uh, and even one flip bit can uh, lead to a security uh, threat. So if we just uh, put this card master key on mobile device, on Android device, this already uh, rings alarms. So we know a lot of uh, Android phones uh, are rooted and used for uh, different kind of uh, various mm, b b mm, for bad uses, basically. So we can't do this. Uh, no norm. Theoretically, you can, but no normal payment network would allow you to do this. So they Mastercard needed to invent something how we can provide payments on the device using the current EMV infrastructure, but not using card master keys on the device. So they came up with the idea of cloud, uh, that Mastercard will store the uh, keys on the cloud, card master keys, and will derive a uh, limited amount of number of keys in the cloud and send those a limited amount of uh, keys uh, to mobile device. Uh, that's why they're called cloud-based payments. Uh, these limited number of keys which are sent to the mobile device are called session keys. Those are also keys which are derived per transaction when you put a card inside uh, a terminal or when you make a contactless uh, payment uh, uh, with your card. Uh, card processor will create a new session key every time you do that. So these session keys are uh, generated on the cloud and they are sent securely to mobile device. The mobile device must secure, uh, store them securely uh, as they can be used for purchases. So if you hack a mobile device uh, and you extract these session keys, you could make payments. Uh, one of the main uh, mitigations for this attack is that all cloud-based payments are made online, authorized online. This is very specific for cloud-based payments. Uh, yeah, there is a very unique way how to uh, implement this, that uh, payment uh, card transaction will be sent online. So uh, I can show you a demo. This will be a simulated card transaction using a plastic card and cloud-based uh, payment uh, card. And we can analyze APDU messages and have a look how it looks like uh, in the real life. So I have provided some script. Uh, and I have this NFC uh, device. You can buy it on Amazon or eBay for $20, $30. Uh, dollars. It, if you want to, it used to be even cheaper. Attach it to your computer and you can scan cards. That doesn't mean you can authorize transactions, but at least you can analyze data. So theoretically, if you have this device, steal someone's plastic card, you can read PAN number. You can't read customer name or CVV numbers, but uh, you still can gain some information. Uh, useless information, but still. So just to show it how it works, uh, have this device, it uh, pretends to be payment uh, terminal. So when I tap the card, we can see the interaction. This is what happens uh, in real life when you make a payment. Uh, when you enter a card inside a POS or when you tap contactless, this is EMV protocol, uh, APDU messages and most of the world except uh, United States and Israel, they're moving to EMV as well, uh, steadily, but uh, currently in Europe, most of the transactions will look like this. Uh, 
what we are interested in. Um, if you see um, CAPDU, these are messages what terminal sends to the card and RAPDU means what card is responding to the terminal. So by analyzing these numbers or, or hexadecimal values, we can uh, extract some information from the card. So uh, I can show you. Uh, this is already expired card, my personal card. So if you will see my PIN number or any data, uh, don't celebrate it because it's useless. Uh, so uh, I will. I copied uh, from here. Uh, we are reading some records on the card, and uh, this one particular record, record one, uh, will uh, provide some data about the card. Okay, I will paste it easily in one BP Tools application. It's available for free online, uh, and when you enter the data, it will parse it out and display it in human readable form. Uh, okay, I see that it's a read record. Uh, I will zoom in a little bit uh, so you can see at the back as well. Uh, okay, I think. And this is various data which is uh, hard coded on the card. So I can see my PAN number. So theoretically, if there are shops which only require PAN number, uh, you could make this purchase. Uh, but I'm not sure if it's probable nowadays. And we can see the expiry date uh, and we can see other information here as well. Uh, so if we go back to the tool uh, and I will show you uh, a real cloud-based payment as well. Uh, this is production card and this um, this is actual real data, what you will see, uh, but the uh, PAN number is tokenized, so even if you steal it, you will not be able to make any purchases online. Okay, um, uh, let's have a look. Run the scripts and tapping. Okay, and we see the same data. Looks similar, and we can again analyze what is, uh, show, uh, wh what is stored in the record one. Okay. Uh, copying, uh, going to the free analysis tool. I'll zoom in again. And again, we can see my PAN number. You can write it down, but nothing will happen. Uh, and the way how cloud-based payments are processed online, this is a very unique and smart way what MasterCard has invented. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are involved with DMV payments or have an understanding of uh, all these little nitty uh, bits. Um, but on cloud-based payments, uh, we can see that application expiration date, this is your card valid through data. So it is valid through to year 2023. But if I open application effective day, this is when the date when card is valid from, we can see it's 2049. So all the cloud-based payment cards valid from date is set somewhere in a far uh, future. And we can see also in issuer action codes, uh, there is number six on the second byte. And when we look at EMV specifications, what it means, it means we want to go online if application is not yet effective. So in this smart configuration, MasterCard has set that all if terminal looks at this data, it knows that uh, transaction must be authorized online. And that is compulsory and all the cards which are called based payments are done like that. Okay. So uh, if we go back to presentation, so there are many requirements for, for uh, issuers who want to implement cloud-based payments on their uh, mobile applications or mobile wallets. Uh, you need to have a security audit. 
uh, this has to be done for each payment network. So if you issue both Visa and MasterCard, you need to perform a security audit for Visa and MasterCard every year. Uh, this is serious uh, business. Uh, what they're doing in the audit, they will try to break your application in many different ways and most likely, well, in most cases, they will be able to uh, extract data and make transactions. However, uh, they always uh, try to uh, show how, how much time it takes to do uh, to, to retrieve these credentials. For example, if it takes three and four months to extract the data and very good knowledge of uh, cryptography, then they assume, okay, no normal person who is that smart uh, will do uh, this to retrieve five different credentials which you could use for spending uh, 150 euros. So uh, uh, they try to balance it out and understand if it's actually a uh, viable case. Um, and very important part of this is white box cryptography, uh, which is needed for cloud-based payments. Uh, this is a topic on itself, uh, by itself, so uh, maybe next year if there's a payment conference we can have a talk about white box cryptography. Uh, and another requirement is that most of the cryptography happens in native code or native libraries on Android. So if you're an Android developer, you normally write your source code in Java or Kotlin nowadays. However, that would not qualify for security audits. Uh, they want your security and storage encryption uh, and transaction processing to be, perf uh, to be done in native source code. So you will need to have a person involved who knows C++ or C. And um, that is why uh, many banks are not interested in these uh, wallets uh, and especially to make themselves those. So attackers' goals are to uh, execute mobile application on untrusted device. So if I find someone else's device, I could copy the application and run it on my personal device or an emulator and try to retrieve uh, these session keys uh, which can be used for payments. And another way is to uh, bypass TLS and use a man in the middle attacks which you uh, can then monitor traffic and maybe extract uh, session keys from there. Okay, and uh, practical protection mechanisms are uh, root and debugger detection. I'm not sure how many of you are Android developers, but you probably have heard these terms if you are. Uh, device fingerprinting, code obfuscation, that is uh, almost uh, every uh, Android developer has been involved with co code obfuscation. At in most parts it is uh, already available. Uh, white box cryptography and public slash certificate key pinning. So we'll go through them. Uh, one by one. Uh, root and debugger detection. This is very complicated. Uh, so you don't want your bank application to be run on a device which is rooted. Uh, how to... Uh, uh, that is very problematic uh, for some banks, especially in Southern Europe, uh, because many phones which you can buy there are already from the shop installed with some uh, weird applications which can't uh, be trusted and some of the algorithms uh, think that they're already rooted. So there are various mechanisms how to detect. Uh, so first, first of all, and the <coughs> most simple one is to uh, detect uh, cloaking applications just by checking uh, uh, package names on Android device you can read applications which are installed on the device and just check the names. If one of them uh, are known to be routing application, you can assume that the device is routed and disable cloud-based payments there. Um, try to detect test keys in build tags as well when a project is built. Uh, there are some uh, metadata added within the APK file and you can also parse through the data and try to match some strings. 
And uh, this is more complicated. The third part, um, this applies also to hooking detection. Uh, if any of you have tried to hack Android, you probably have heard about Frida. And um, Frida uh, is a tool which you can run on your mobile device. Uh, and it allows to do various malicious stuff. Uh, and it creates a server on your device. So you can, uh, if you want to protect against Frida, you try to connect to Frida server with known ports and try to send some messages. You can find it on Google how to do that, but uh, many developers say that Frida is not detectable, but it is actually, you just have to uh, read the newest uh, stuff on online. Uh, hooking detection, uh, this was already mentioned before. Uh, hooking means that uh, some of the methods which are on Android uh, system uh, can be hooked and uh, you can implement their own uh, logic. Uh, and uh, we want to avoid that as well. Uh, hooking detection uh, uh, tools, which you can uh, have probably heard as well, exposed Frida and mobile substrate. Uh, there are various tactics how to uh, avoid code injections in that cases, in those cases. Uh, hooking mit mitigations, check for hooking software install, same as with uh, uh, previously mentioned. Uh, you also check package names. If one of them uh, looks suspicious, disable cloud-based payments. Uh, you can check uh, stack traces for suspicious method calls as well. If you see something like that, disable uh, cloud-based payments. And you can also monitor CPU timing uh, on some methods. And if you look, if you see that uh, some of the methods are executing more than they should, that means there's something uh, sketchy happening behind the scenes as well. So in that case as well, disable cloud-based payments. And the fourth one, this is the most uh, complicated part. Uh, when I said, if you want to make a cloud-based payments project, you need to have a C++ or C developer. In this case, you need uh, assembler developer as well. I'm not sure if there's a big market for assembler developers nowadays, uh, but you can uh, re-implement uh, system calls on Android source, uh, wrap them uh, within your own C library and create your own C library. So when some uh, tools like Frida, they will try to use system C library, you will be able to detect in your own implementation. Uh, this is very complicated part and uh, for many uh, banks, if they will see something like uh, this is a requirement, they would just think that there's no way we're gonna implement cloud-based payments ourselves. Uh, integrity protection. Um, this is again, when I said uh, integrity protection slash cloning, uh, when you steal someone's phone, you want to clone the application and put it in your own device uh, and retrieve session keys. Uh, solution is to calculate unique fingerprint of the device and every time uh, when you use a fingerprint uh, in any decryption or macking uh, methods you always recalculate fingerprint uh, every time before you do this uh, method call if you will spot a difference in a device's fingerprint you know that this device is cloned and uh, the source code is not running on the uh, device where the card was provisioned firstly. So if we see uh, device A, uh, you can uh, extract some data uh, in uh, native library and provide a, and store a fingerprint of this device. Uh, attacker's goal is to have a device B uh, where they can emulate the application uh, and uh, have the same fingerprint provided as well. However, in, in real life, uh, our goal for mitigating this risk is that this is not possible. When attacker runs your application, your banking application on a different device, fingerprint will always be generated dynamically and they will never be able to 
uh, generate the same fingerprint or as on original device. So that's a good mitigation. So this is what I said. And uh, it also has to be in done in native libraries. So again, C, C++ developer needs to be involved. Uh, white box cryptography, as I said, that's a topic on its own. Uh, not sure how many of you have heard it. Uh, the problem with Android devices is that you can actually uh, look at the memory uh, dynamically with analysis tools and you don't want to have your uh, keys uh, stored in one location. So if we use normal AES-128 uh, encryption keys, you don't want an attacker to spot it somewhere in the source code. Ah, okay, uh, there's a, uh, this key, I can copy it on any other device or on emulator, <coughs> I don't even need to calculate fingerprint. So what white box cryptography does, it, uh, it extracts the key and hides it within the uh, source code. So it's called white box that you can actually open the box. You can see the th see through everything what is happening, all the encryption and decryption methods. Uh, you can see input and output of these methods, but you still will not be able to extract a key. You will not have a one single point where you can have a look. Uh, there's the key, I can extract it. It's hidden within the source code. And uh, it, uh, it is important to have a strong code obfuscation for this as well. Uh, and uh, this is the last part uh, when we have a man in the middle attack. This is when uh, we want to uh, there's a picture. Uh, to normal cases, you uh, create your own um, mobile hotspot, like in this conference. You could uh, create a hotspot, have, uh, have it named as Payment Con 2020. Uh, your mobile devices would connect to this hotspot, and uh, uh, attacker could uh, pretend uh, to. to uh, send your requests to uh, of you to your bank. However, uh, attacker would be able to decrypt the communication if it's in TLS, uh, if they could provide the certificates. Uh, these are known attacks, uh, and on mobile devices, it is uh, as they're using various Wi-Fi networks. This is very uh, normal case what we have seen, and there needs to be a protection for public. Uh, or certificate pinning as in normal cases. Uh, so how we can mitigate this attack is that we need to have your bank's uh, leaf certificate built in or public key built in into your mobile application. Uh, so I can uh, show a small demo. Uh, when we're talking about um, uh, certificate chains and trust authorities. Okay, uh, I can just make a request to our test server and I'll zoom in. We can look at the certificates. Uh, this was TLS uh, connection and we can see the leave certificate and when we check the details we can see public key uh, if I can spot where it is uh, mm -hmm. No, oh, okay, there's public key. So this certificate has a specific public key assigned to it. Uh, and we can check this. We can extract the public key and build it within our application. So let's look how it looks like on Android debugger. Uh, let's hope everything will work. And let's see if it is... Okay, I will put some debug points in the compiled source code. Uh, and this is a class which is responsible in Android uh, for establishing uh, TLS connection. You can uh, uh, implement your own implementation for this protocol and you can monitor 
uh, all the requests and uh, TLS communication uh, 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 for your uh, HTTP requests. So uh, let's just quickly run the code uh, with debugger attached and I'll try to make the connection to the same web page which I showed you previously in the web browser. Uh, let's, okay, so we still have some time. Okay, I have a test application. When I'll press a button register, it will try to go to the web page which I showed you. And when it will try to establish TLS connection, uh, breakpoint will be, uh, source code will stop at the breakpoints. Okay, we see that TLS communication uh, was started and we can see a certificate chain which we retrieved from the server. So uh, in the source code, we will go through each one of those certificates uh, and we'll try to match them uh, what is built uh, w within our application. If none of those certificates matches what we have built in, that means someone is in the middle and uh, has provided their own certificate and we can detect man in the middle attack there. Okay, uh, let's stop the project. Uh, and conclusions for cloud-based payments uh, and security for them is that state-of-the-art device root checks should always be performed. You can always keep uh, uh, the latest methods. You, you can check them online. Uh, there are various blogs, various forums, uh, which, which will show uh, various tools which are used currently. Uh, you need to have uh, good device fingerprinting to protect against cloning. Uh, also, source code obfuscation uh, is a must. White bo box cryptography is a must. And uh, certificate public key pinning uh, is also a must. Probably, if you don't develop anything which is related to banking, uh, you would never see any of these um, <coughs> terms there. But this is it, and we still got some time for questions. Uh, thank you, Armat. Uh, that was fascinating. We have some questions. Yep. So the first one is provocative. Uh, isn't it easier just to glue your contactless plastic payment card to your phone instead of dealing with all of this? Hustle. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> I have heard it many times. Uh, one one distinct, uh, distinguished feature between uh, gluing the card and uh, using your issuer wallet is that with card you can make uh, transactions uh, without uh, entering uh, your online PIN up to 25 euros in Europe and uh, in, not in Europe but in Baltic states uh, and you would have to then unglue it, enter it inside, and uh, glue it back on. If you have a cloud-based payment solution, there are various uh, types how you can integrate, but in most cases that will work the same as Apple Pay, uh, that you just uh, unlock your phone and tap and everything is ready. That's the answer. Yeah, but if you like gluing and ungluing things, it's also a possibility. Okay. So Okay, it's a technical question. Does session key parameters differ for mobile phones and some other wearable devices for the same card? Uh, yes, yep. Uh, each card master key, which I showed previously, uh, maybe I can show the... Uh, yep, uh, this will be, uh, card master key will be unique for each of the devices. If you have a, a Garmin wallet, it will have a different card master key if you have Apple Wallet, it will have a different one there as well. So based on master key being different, also session keys will be different for each device. So you can't steal just the wearable device's key and use it somewhere else. Okay, so next question. So why not to switch to Apple, iOS? Uh, 
cloud-based payments or your device. That's the, uh, uh, if you want to switch uh, your device, you are always welcome <laughs> to use iPhone. I'm an iPhone user as well. Uh, a problem with iPhones is that you can't have a cloud, uh, host card emulation. Apple does not allow it. However, there's a trial in Germany what everyone is following in the cloud-based payments community uh, that Germany might actually tell Apple to open up their uh, payments and it might be that next year when we uh, are here for the conference I will show cloud-based payments on Apple. So, so there are EMV standards but Apple not allows it to happen? Uh, e Apple wants to control as Apple. Uh, you can have uh, contactless payments but they will be stored on Apple and if you are an issuer, a bank, who wants to use, uh, who wants to uh, provision your card on Apple devices, you have to have agreement with Apple. Uh, money as well, they want per transaction, per project, and uh, it's expensive. If you want to have a cloud-based payments, that's uh, only with the provider, or you can implement yourself and it's free. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, the last question, why issue buzzers Im implementing their own wallets instead of Apple, Google Pays, and uh, I guess, also relation yeah, between? Yeah, uh, there are two points for that. Uh, this applies for Google uh, as a person uh, who is normally using Android would not switch to Apple just to have these payments. Uh, but uh, Google Wallet is not available in every country in Europe. So Baltic states are not enabled currently. So only way how to have payments uh, on your Android phone is to have issuer wallet. Uh, and many other countries currently as well. Google has said, we don't want any new countries. I don't know the reason for it, but uh, that's the first option, that it's not available in your location. And the second reason for having <coughs> your issuer wallet is that you want, many banks want their customers opening bank application. When you make a payment from uh, Google Pay, you will see only Google Wallet. Uh, but uh, we have cases where banks, after a transaction, when a uh, transaction opens their application, they want to show an advertisement, a suggestion for credit card or for a small loan. So that's the way for banks to attract customers within uh, their own applications. But I is it uh, true to say that uh, s Google Pay and Apple Pay still work based on the same Technology. Yeah, that's uh, also a very good question. Apple pay no, uh, Garmin pay no, Fitbit pay no, and the only real uh, big tech company which uses cloud-based payments is Google. Uh, their Google Wallet is actually using the methods and technology as was shown today.